Hello and welcome. My name is Paul Brettel from Hewlett Packard Enterprise and I'm going to walk through a very quick presentation around what an intelligent SOC could look like. So without further ado, let's crack on with the presentation. So here we have a quick illustration of some of the aspects and some of the elements that we would consider to be part of a modern security operations environment. We can see there's a whole mixture of components and systems and people that would interact with this. And of course it will vary according to the level of sophistication, uh, the complexity of the infrastructure, and additionally the amount of investment that's gone into that environment. But in essence, we're looking at a number of things that we need to be doing, a number of roles that we need to be carrying out. And this will all help towards our detection and resolution of uh, and understanding some of the, the security threats that we actually see. So let's start off firstly, we're going to have some data coming in, this, the logs and events from the systems, the applications, from the users, the endpoints, from virtually any kind of system. And we need to be collecting those. And then we also want to be running that through what we call a real-time correlation. Uh, engine. Now that's going to generate some alerts and it's going to generate things that we need to do some investigation on. That's when we're going to get the first level of interaction that our, our analysts are going to be making use of. So typically those alerts created in real time will be passed along to what we call a SOC workflow. And that's typically some form of queue or queuing mechanism that we can hand this information to our security analyst level one. So what we also call the L1 or level one analysts. These are the individuals that would then be looking at that initial set of alerts and information and doing an initial triage on that. Now we typically work on the basis of something around about three to five minutes is that typical triage process because they're dealing with these alerts in real time. They're being received from those logs and events and processed part of that real-time correlation engine so we can understand what the context, the relevance, the importance and the priority is. Now again it's this three Three to five minute window what we do want to do is understand is this a real incident now if it is a real incident we probably want to be handing that on and handing that as part of a further ongoing investigation Alternatively, if it is something that is relatively simple and straightforward, why this is the situation where these level one analysts should be able to look at it, triage it, and go, well, I don't consider this to be a major problem. Uh, maybe I'll pick it up later when I've got a few more minutes spare. But in a prioritization process, I need to move on to what's the more important aspects and the threats that we can see. So that's typically the first level of this real-time monitoring that these level one analysts are looking at and understanding the incidents as they occur. Now, if something genuinely does occur and those level one analysts do identify something that they constitute is a, an incident that, need, that does require and need further investigation, that doesn't necessarily mean it's real. What we're trying to do is reduce the false positives, we're trying to reduce the amount of effort required in detailed analysis but that's okay because it could be real but we want to pass it on to in this particular case our security analysts level two as part of an investigation process now of course it will vary according to situation and circumstance and customer and level of sophistication and infrastructure as well uh, but a classic example is where a further detailed level of investigation needs to be carried out on these alerts to ascertain exactly what's gone on what's the importance what's the relevance what do we uh, what's the impact what do we have to understand with regards to users and also uh, we have to have a incident management process in place so they're typically now going to be interacting with systems to look at investigate through and drive through some of our data so you can see here we're doing things like investigation queries we're looking at this what we would consider for example a security data warehouse where we've got this data and we can go back through the information understand what's going on uh, understand the aspects and the elements that are involved the actors and the attackers and the incidents of uh, uh, the compromise uh, indicators and ultimately to understand what we consider what we call the blast radius. How far does this go? So the level two analysts are now carrying out active investigations, looking at th and through the data, asking questions of 
you know, simple things like what did that particular user do yesterday? Uh, what did they do last month? And how does that compare as a baseline against the other users? Are they doing extraordinary things like huge amounts of data in or out of the organization or logging in or out of uh, the applications and systems at very unusual times? The, the context and the data that needs to be looked at is much wider, much deeper, and normally in some form of comparison type and investigation process. Now, typically part of an investigation, you, you probably want to be using something like a, an investigation tool or an incident management tool, which will be tracking from an audit point of view, which will be understanding what, what's actually going on and what the individuals are doing and making sure that we have a legal chain of custody with regards to what's going on as well. Now, you can see there's another phase to this as well, where you know, we call it a hunt team, but it could be a level three or a, you know tier three is often uh, used as well. But this is a separate team where they are taking uh, and some of the information, taking some data, for example, from our level two analysts and, and using that to drive intelligence led investigations and hunting activities. So this isn't necessarily triggered from an alert. It's not necessarily triggered something from a real-time correlation, for example. But this is something that with intelligence, uh, with relevance and context, you know, could come from the level two analysts who may have identified some unusual patterns of activity. They can carry on doing their investigation, but they hand over some of those intelligence-led aspects to the hunt team and say, now you can go ahead and start looking back through that data and with the additional intelligence that you have, for example, looking at intelligence feeds, external data, internal data as well, and how you can use, uh, for example, things like analytics to drive some of that aspects of hunting for these unknown threats. And that's the critical thing here, which is the unknown aspect what's known and what's unknown. Now, typically the hunt team is looking for those unknown threats, those unknown aspects, and those unknown actors that are operating typically within the organization. But that's okay, because that's what they're driven by. But when we look back up again for a second, and we look at the level one analysts for a second, they're typically being driven by known threats and aspects, and, and they have priorities of how they need to handle some of that as well. So those known threats are typically driven by the real-time correlation engine. And then typically from a, a level two, they are again driven by those alerts, but looking back through that data into, for example, something like a security data warehouse. And then typically the hunt team are using analytics-based capabilities to drive back through that data on an intelligence-led aspects uh, of, of their role specifically. So you can see there's a difference between the known and the unknown and the way that they would interact as part of that. But let's take a deeper dig into how some of these operations actually occur and, and where would these individuals interact and, and how would there be other roles typically within this environment, within the security operations center itself. So let's take the, the, the gray circle to start with. You know, typically, we're going to be getting uh, data from technology, whether it be from your network, from your environments, from your servers, uh, from your security systems that are generating this data as well, whether it's coming from external systems like intelligence-led and, and threat intelligence data itself. We're typically doing some processing on that. We're going to be storing the data. We're going to be using that data in a correlation engine. Uh, and this example, we're showing it here with the ArcSight ESM real-time correlation platform. But what we're doing is we're processing that data and bringing it together to bring context to what it means. For example, we want to be able to start asking some questions of things like who did what, where did they do it, how did they get there, and what did they do when they got there. So we need to be piecing together lots of these different systems, for example, it, as part of a real-time correlation engine to start answering some of those questions and matching that with a real-time correlation engine to then be able to uh, impose and define what we know from a known-based attacks and how they can be then picked up by an alert mechanism and sent to the level one analyst, for example. So now we've moved on and we've identified that there's a people aspect here. So for example, we've seen some activity that's been correlated by some known rules. 
uh, as part of this case uh, in, uh, here with ArcSight ESM real-time correlation platform, that's then triggered an alert, which has then been sent to the level one analyst. As we mentioned before, typically they'll be looking at something like three to five minutes where they're doing some uh, initial triage to understand the priority, the context and the relevance of what's going on and whether this needs to be investigated any further. If it does need to be investigated any further, they can hand that to the level two analyst. So now they can start digging into and spending much longer on the investigation. You know, we mentioned that level one is typically three to five minutes. Can be long, longer, that's okay. Uh, but typically we want to be focused around doing that prioritization and triage. But a level two analyst, typically working in conjunction with an incident handler, if it is a real incident that we need to understand and deal with, there is typically a very fixed process as part of this. And of course it varies based on geography, based on role, based on situation, even the organization in, in, involved in here as well. So in that environment we need to have almost an unlimited amount of time as part of that incident handling process. Uh, and they need to be involved with other aspects of the business as a whole. So for example, a great scenario is you know, level one analyst identifies that there's some unusual activity by a particular user who's internal to the organization. They conclude that there is genuine activity that is suspicious and it requires further investigation. They hand that to the level two analyst who then starts and kicks off the whole incident process who then would typically trigger uh, something as part of an incident management process application and involving an incident handler but the incident handler then identifies and says whoa, whoa, whoa hang on a second this involves a particularly high privileged user within the organization which is impacted by various legal and governance aspects as well it could even for example be somebody who's based in a particular location or geography where they're protected by workers councils and other privacy rules at that point, they have to work hand in hand with network system uh, owners and application owners, or even within the human resources part of the organization directly to ensure that they have the right aspects and process in place that, that we can ensure that we're handling this correctly, accurately, and fairly. But notice that's typically not the level one and level two who are focused on the operations aspect of security monitoring. And typically, as part of the level two analyst, they'll be identifying things. Uh, they'll be identifying activity, uh, threats, and other changes as well, where they can see things going on. And they will want to hand that, um, for example, unknown or previously unknown or an unidentified aspects and hand that to what we call an engineer or a platform or content engineer. In that point, that's the individual that's then responsible for creating, evolving, and uh, adding additional alerts, processes, correlation rules, and other aspects to the platform to further evolve and improve the levels of detection. The point here, and I have to stress this directly, is we don't want the watchers creating the rules, i.e. the level one or the level two aspect, because it's human psychology that says typically they will make it simpler so they don't get more and more things in their queue to process. We want this to be handled by an external person within the group that we can work together as part of a team to ensure that we get the, get the best levels of detection that we're trying to uh, deliver as part of this capability. So as a quick recap, we're going to have technology that's delivering as information, log data, application information. We're then doing some correlation on that. Uh, in this particular example, we're using ArcSight ESM correlation platform. The level one analyst is identifying and picking up that there's a, a particular alert has been triggered and doing that initial triage. They hand that to the level two. Typically, if this is real and it needs to be escalated further, they hand that to an incident handler, which is external to the actual operations group directly. The incident handler can then work in, in conjunction with the network and system owners, HR, and other aspects of the organization to ensure accurate and fair handling of the incident as a whole. And then typically we want to have a review process where the level two analysts can feed back further information to the 
platform engineer or the content engineer where they can further evolve and improve on the levels of detection we're trying to uh, deliver as part of this. Not forgetting we also want to have a, a biz business owner that has a, an element of part of this process as well so they can identify and overall steer the operations capability as part of this security operations center itself to drive it in the right direction around its levels of capability and its levels of detection going forward. So let's just step back a second uh, to one of my previous uh, illustrations here. So we can see that there's very much some defined roles as part of an intelligent security operations center. We have very specific capabilities. There's a lot more roles as well, don't get me wrong, but we're focusing around the level one analysts, the level two analysts, and the hunt team. They're typically interacting with different components, technologies, and systems, and they do have levels of integration between themselves. But you can see that this is driving three distinct use cases that are assisting in the overall detection and response capability. And we can see that the level one analysts are typically working in conjunction with the real-time correlation and monitoring platform itself, responding to those alerts uh, as quickly as they can to bring the context and do that initial triage. The level two analysts are typically working in, uh, in addition to the level one analyst, but they're working on additional capabilities around asking and being able to answer so much more of those investigation questions. What happened? What's the impact? How does that compare with other activity? And they can then carry out and, and hand off some of that investigation to the incident handling process as well. And then finally, there's the hunt aspect. These are the individuals that go out with intelligence-led activities, go hunting for the bad guys, hunting for those, those actors that are trying to uh, interrupt, change, or get access to our particular applications and systems. Now, typically, they're going to be using an analytics-driven capability. So we can see that it's very much three different roles, three different aspects that just illustrates the difference that we would need to be delivering as part of an intelligence security operations center. And ultimately, this is around delivering and improving on that overall capability. We can see, and it, of course, organizations shouldn't compare themselves on this and think, for example, that because they're not further up in an overall capability graph, that they're somehow lacking or not delivering on what they need to be delivering. That's not fair because some organizations that could be, very, for example, very small have a very high requirement around some of this functionality, whereas other organizations, which might be dramatically larger, are not impacted by some of these aspects directly, so therefore don't have that level of, of sophistication that's required. So it, it varies by customer, organization, location, region, and so on. But typically, this is a good illustration of the levels of a capability that would typically need as part of an intelligent security operations center. You know, we've gone on from just centralizing logs with log management to a more sophisticated level of data analysis where we're doing correlation, some advanced forensics capability, and the ability to generate a number of reports and aspects to give us intelligence of what's going on. We then need to move to much more sophisticated capability to deliver on much higher fidelity around correlation and being able to understand how we can do that in real time. We need to move to a real-time analysis and incident response, and that's that's a big step forward. We need to not only just be able to have a real-time correlation engine, for example, but we need to have the capability that we can respond to that in real time too. Uh, that means we need to do that level one and analysis and contextual understanding of what's going on. But additionally, we need to have an, a set of capabilities and individuals that will help us as part of the incident handling as well. Now, that can take time, but it needs to be able to be triggered in real time as the events and as the threats appear. And then ultimately, what we're doing is driving that forward and being able to deliver on this vision of, of true security intelligence, the ability to, to, to have in-depth analysis, being able to do a level of predictivity to what we're trying to identify. Can we get ahead of the threats before they're really there? And then ultimately being able to solve some of the more advanced use cases and identify those new threats. That's where we start delivering on the capabilities. But you can see that there is a number of phases that we need to move to to get to that overall set of capabilities. We don't just get there at stage one. There's a number of individuals, 
a number of roles and aspects to our security operations environment to get there in the first place. Anyway, that's enough from me. Uh, I wish to thank you very much for your time and listening. Thank you.